This is On the Other Hand. a podcast sponsored by Braver Angels in Arkansas that explores politics and other issues of importance to Arkansans through conversations with community leaders. Stay with us as we talk to another leader in Arkansas who works across differences to get things done and to bring us closer together. Hello and welcome to On the Other Hand. I'm your host, Glenn White. I'm here with my co-host, April Chatham Carpenter. On our podcast, as you know, April and I interview community leaders in Arkansas who help work towards solutions across various political or other divides or who in other ways reach across various divisions within our community. We also on occasion feature subject matter experts, and that is the case today. So, April, uh, tell us about our guest. Yeah, Glenn. Um, today, we're going to have the privilege of talking with Dr. Blake Perkins. Dr. Uh, Perkins has a PhD in history from West Virginia University. He's currently the uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for Academics and an Associate Professor of History at Arkansas State University, BB. And we came across uh, Blake's work because of his research on the life of what he calls Ozarkers during the late 1800s to the mid-1900s. And in his work, he has focused on the impact of divisions between rural and town people and between small farmers and businessmen when, you know, the rural urban divide has become, I think, even a wider divide nationally. And there's research to show that it can lead to political polarization. So we wanted to have Blake on to talk about his work. We originally came across his work in a recent article by Bill Bowden in the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. And realized that there were some interesting implications that might shed light on this particular source of current political division and in our state in particular. So we're going to learn more about his research, Glenn. We're going to discuss some possible ways that his analysis of Ozarkers might help shed some light on current controversies in the state, including the recent discussion about changing the status of the Buffalo River, which has uh, been a, a point of contention with folks in that area. So welcome to, on the other hand, Blake. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me. Well, we always start out with our guests by having them tell a little bit about themselves, um, maybe a brief bit about their early life and how it led to their current career and, and your current positions at ASU BB. So tell us what you would like to have our listeners know about you and your early uh, kind of where you are to where you came from. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, as as you as you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a, a history professor and in, in academic administration at ASUBB now. Uh, I've been been working in high, higher ed, teaching college level history for oh uh, more than ten years now. I have to add them up, <laughs> but uh, I've been been in this business for for quite some time. Uh, I am a native uh, Arkansan. Uh, I grew up in on a uh, a fifth generation uh, cattle farm uh, along the Strawberry River near Smithville in western Lawrence County, and actually our farm crossed the county line over to Sharp County. So that's the area that I'm that I'm from, and, and family's got deep roots in the uh, Ozarks foothills there, and and even before that up in, in Missouri, uh, the Missouri Ozarks as well. So uh, grew up there. Uh, uh, we we raised cattle and and. Uh, Harvested hay and, and and that kind of thing. Uh, my my mother uh, was a U.S. postal worker. I had all kinds of different jobs. She, she actually just retired from that. Uh, well, less than a year year or so ago. Um, so I always always uh, lived in a small town, uh, really out on the farm and small town there. Went to a, a very small public high school, uh, Lynn. Uh, it was in the Lynn School District at that time. I graduated there in 2004. The, the following year, uh, due to the um, Lakeview case and uh, Governor, then Governor Mike Huckabee's uh, uh, plan for addressing that, uh, uh, the, the district was forced to consolidate. And so it's now Hillcrest uh, School District uh, there. And I still live in that area. I uh, still live, live uh, I live in Lynn, actually. Um, and actually serve on the on the school board there at Hillcrest. But uh, anyway, uh, went to school there at Lynn, um, and then from there I went to Lyon College in Baseville and uh, majored in history there. Uh, and from Lyon College I went to Missouri State University 
and worked with uh, Ozark's historian uh, Brooks Blevins, who's written uh, many, many books about uh, articles about about the Ozarks. He's he's kind of the the scholar you know, on the on the Ozarks, and so uh, and then from there I went uh, to uh, West Virginia University uh, for my PhD in history and uh, uh, really studied uh, kind of the rural South and and uh, uh, rural Appalachia, especially the upland South. Uh, there at West Virginia, and, and so uh, I came back to Arkansas. Uh, actually, before I uh, before I finished my my doctorate and began teaching at Williams Baptist University uh, in Walnut Ridge, my home county, and uh, I, I taught there and, and chaired the history department, history and political science department there for oh, I guess uh, eight or nine years uh, before I took took this position. So that's a little bit about about, about who I am and where where I. Uh, came from. So, well, thank you for sharing that. I, I always think about, um, you know, how as professors, we, we tend to study things sometimes that are near and dear to our heart. And it sounds like that being raised in, in rural Arkansas and small town Arkansas might have been um, some of the impetus for your, your getting interested in studying that. Uh, would you say that's true for you? It, it is. And, you know, I, I, I should mention too that, uh, uh, I mean, I grew up around both my maternal and paternal grandparents uh knew them well and and uh i mean they were always just part of our life you know that just the extended family there and i even uh even got to know uh seven of my eight great grandparents uh, who were all within about a probably seven or eight mile radius uh, of, of everyone there so yeah that definitely uh my interest in in their lives stories they would tell i mean that's what that's what really drew me to, to history. Uh, no doubt about that. Great that you spent time getting to know some of those generations and getting to hear their stories. Well, I would love for you, uh, for our listeners, just to describe some key high points that you've you've been finding in your research on rural urban differences in Arkansas, just a few. And then we'll probably go into, you know, some more of them into the little bit of the weeds of them as we ask additional questions. So Okay. Yeah. So, uh, in 2017, uh, University of Illinois Press uh, published uh, my book, Hillbilly Hellraisers, uh, as part of its uh, working class in American history series. And uh, that really was uh, a revised version of my doctoral dissertation uh, work there. But it uh, so uh, it, it really looks at um, several, you might call them case studies uh, from the late 1800s on into the middle of the 1900s, in which uh, rural Ozarkers were uh, encountering various programs uh, of, of kind of government authority, government power, and so forth, and 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 resisting those in some form or another, and so uh, so that's what the book is about, and and uh, so it's got uh, there's a chapter, for instance, on uh, of course, stereotypes, right? This, that's one of the big, the big themes of the book is challenging uh, stereotypes. Uh, this, these kinds of simplistic uh, depictions that that many people have of, of rural hill folks as you know being uh, kind of backward, out of step, the other, right? Uh, not really in in line with the rest of, of America, at least modern America. And and one of those, I guess, sub stereotypes of kind of that image is that rural hill folks have always been you know obstinately defiant uh and and opposed to anything that smacks of government right so uh that's one of the things i was looking at and and you know in each of these cases at first glance um it does appear right that they are resisting the feds and 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 different arms of, of the U.S. government, but but digging deeper, as we historians do, into the facts and getting to know the people through the documentary record as best we can, which is sometimes challenging, of course, when you're trying to document rural folks uh, who didn't necessarily leave diaries and journals and write letters to one another, uh, that kind of thing. But uh, digging in, though, I mean, I found that, that this is much more complex, as we all are, as, all, as human beings. We're complex. Uh, we we uh, there were there were real uh, rational reasons uh, behind a lot of their 
opposition and uh in fact one of the one of the things that I, I discovered at least since my, the earlier part of the book there was that resistance to the federal government wasn't always really resistance to you know Washington DC it was often uh it was often local conflict playing out you know uh, kind of uh, at that level and 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 really a often a very you know kind of a rural versus town divide and of course of course, the towns and the more uh, well-to-do, influential folks had the levers of, of government. Uh, you know that they were working there, and and, and often uh, perhaps against the interests of, of the rural folks uh, out on the farms and, and that kind of thing. And so, that, yeah, there's a chapter chapter about, uh, for instance, uh, um, you know the uh, moonshiners and and, uh, and unfortunately a, a deadly incident that I zero in on and. In 1897, which there was a shootout between some uh, small farmers uh, there with distilling distilling moonshine and and the uh, and federal marshals that attempted to raid and and uh, you know shut them down there. Um, there's also uh, a chapter in there on uh, some rural resistance to some uh, early USDA you know uh, progressive agriculture programs. Uh, and uh, even some surprisingly to some perhaps, but uh, major uh, draft resistance among rural folks uh, during World War One. Uh, that's another another chapter. So anyway, just kind of like I said, just some some case studies that I really zero in on, and you might you might call micro histories. We kind of put the microscope over it and zoom in, and to really see what's going on, try to dig beneath those those stereotypes. And that's really what what the book is about, and and kind of what my my research is really kind of focused on. Uh, uh, even since then, so. Thank you for that, Blake. You know, before we go any further, because I'm going to ask you a couple of uh, questions in some depth about some of the, the local issues that may relate to to, to what uh, we're talking about. But since you're a historian, it occurs to me, a lot of us don't have maybe at best a vague notion of what historians do. And I wonder if, and I, and I think about that quote, which I think is some version of something that Santayana said he it says basically if if we don't learn from history we risk repeating our mistakes so i wonder if you could just kind of give us a little quick reader's digest uh defense of what uh, a historian does and what the study of history how we can use that for the betterment of our society yeah okay uh sure so so yeah i mean most academics would uh would clarify that you know History never really truly repeats itself, right? You can never really repeat, uh, you, know, you know, like a scientific experiment or something. All of the conditions that, you know, you can never really replicate that in any given time. But, but yeah, I mean, there's certainly there are are patterns. I mean, really, history is the study of human beings, right, and, and human nature, and and uh, and and they're they're real life examples. And so historians, uh, of course, we're we're tethered to to the facts and what's available to us in the documentary record, um, and so uh, you know. Uh, but but historical research, uh, historical thinking, you know, kind of opens a window to us to, you know, uh, draw connections right uh, between our own times and 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 uh, oh well, uh, that, you know. Such and such happened, you know. That's that's similar, right? So we can we can learn from that and and help guide us. Now, you know, historians are certainly not fortune tellers, and uh, and and you know, most of us would uh, would 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 humbly admit that. You know, we, there's no way we can can again because history never really truly repeats itself. So no way we can really pre- predict the future or anything like that. But there we can certainly offer some insights into uh and into patterns and and uh, you know, just context is, is important, right? Why things happened the way they did instead of these simplistic um, kinds of uh, ideas that we may have or assumptions that we may have. So so historians are about really digging in and, and searching for uh, the truth as best as it can be found in the, in the documentary record. Yeah, and I appreciate very much that you say that historians really focus on facts, you know, information that can be vetted and have some confidence in because, you know, how as human beings are, we can spread rumors and conspiracy theories and the whole bits. I really appreciate that. So 
as a subject matter expert here that we're talking about in the same way that uh, April was mentioning, we're thinking your research and writings about Ozarkers can help us understand something that we focus on in our work with Braver Angels, which is trying to reduce political polarization, usually between what we call reds and blues. Uh, in your writing, you talk about uh, Ozarkers being skeptical of outsiders in some fashion. Um the uh, research that we know about political polarization in general, uh, it includes a strong dose of how we all are social animals. And as social animals, then we're predisposed to form into groups and to adopt strong emotional attachment to our group's ideas and norms. Your research describes how rural Arkansans, Ozarkers, as a group often display suspicion toward you know, Correct me if I'm wrong on this, but from what I'd read, it sounded like one area of skepticism is, you know, people of wealth, people from more urban areas or just people from outside their home area. Uh, so does that is, is that at least partially true? Is that about right? Did I get that? Yeah, 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 I think so. Um, you know, in my in my work, I'm particularly focusing on. Uh, what I refer to, and many historians refer to, is kind of the populist era there, the late 1800s rolls over into the early 1900s. And um, that's an era, of course, you know, in, in broader American history, many, many textbook chapters and so forth, would, you know, call that the, the Gilded Age, right? Uh, a term that Mark Twain had, had coined there, that, you know, kind of it seemed on, on, the, on the outside to be an era of growing prosperity and wealth and and just forward marching right in, in, in the American nation but digging beneath that you know the gilded outer layer uh, things weren't weren't maybe quite so so shiny uh, and and so I think that's that's the context we see here in, in in a place like the rural Ozarks and not just the rural Ozarks but other other rural areas as well um, you know um, it became it was an era in which uh, the pressures began to really mount on uh, small farmers. You know, I mean, by, by, you know, that's kind of a definition to something I've kind of grappled with on that. But by small farmers, I'm really referring to uh, a, a farm in which, for the most part, uh, the labor is done by the family unit, right? Not not really hiring out others for labor, not really using a wage type system, but but family. Family members doing doing the, doing the labor and so forth. So anyway, um, it, it became more difficult. Um, you know, railroads, for example, that was one of the things that, that a lot of rural Ozarkers, a lot, a lot of rural people in general throughout America, uh, had been really excited about. Right, these these railroads coming, all these promises made that, hey man, this is going this is going to open new opportunities for us, uh, marketing our crops and, and that kind of thing, and, and it did. But it, but it also, uh, in many ways caused kind of some centralization of some markets there that didn't always uh, uh, turn out so well for, for the smaller smaller farmers kind of on the lower end of the, of the totem pole, you might say. And also things like uh, they began to face uh, railroad rates that, well, we weren't expecting this, right? I mean, it, uh, this is going to bite too far into our, our uh, you know, our, our income and the way we support our family and so that's just an example, I guess. And and so to, to your point about, you know, suspicion of, of people with money, I think that's I think that's really right on. I mean, it's, it's, and so uh, the, the, the suspicion that began to arise that that and, and, and with with a lot of truth to it, that uh, people with money uh, have the. Uh, the best access to political power and, and and gaining the resources to implement new changes and programs and such and I mean I think many rural rural Ozarkers felt like well you know they're doing this you know they're saying this is going to be best for the entire region but but really it's just kind of more it's best for them town folks uh, business folks larger farmers you know uh, who did employ you know wage hands and, and and that kind of thing and so that was I think one of the one of the big one of the big things that again kind of led to a a bit of a political revolt in, in Arkansas and some other or other rural places. Uh, okay. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that's part of it. You, you know, you mentioned the outsiders, the suspicion of outsiders. Uh, that's, 
I think probably a bit overblown in some of the stereotypes. I mean, that's that's one of the big, you know, the rural mountain folks are, you know, you know, innately suspicious of, of outsiders. Um, I think there's a grain of truth to that, again, because their experiences often with outsiders or those same experiences we're talking about, these the outside people and resources that come in and often change things and, and they end up with the short end of the stick. And so I think, you know, I think there's again some some rational, uh, you know, some logic to, to that. Uh, but there were instances uh, as well of of outsiders coming in who put down roots. They they worked hard to fit in with the communities, uh, respected the communities uh, that they were now living in, and and I mean they they in some cases became key leaders, you know of. Mm-hmm. Of, uh, of those communities. I, I'm thinking of one person in particular, his name was Isaac McCracken. Uh, he, he was actually a Canadian. He uh, had been born in Canada and grew up in uh, New England. Uh, worked on some whaling ships as a young man and, and then had migrated, uh, I think, to Minnesota. And ended up, anyway, found his way down to uh, Arkansas, the Ozarks, uh, northwestern Arkansas, um, by the 1880s or so. And uh, you know, he uh, he ended up becoming key leader uh, of of some of those local political movements that 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 were starting there. Um, very well respected uh, in that movement, and it's it's you know again he's one of those that we don't have you know there's no diary or, or journal or anything to really know exactly what was going through his mind and how he did things and that kind of thing. But from what from what we have available to us, documentary record, he really. Uh, Invested himself in in the community, uh, uh, respected the the small farmers around him, and and uh, uh, really made them feel like he was kind of one of them, right? And, and mm-hmm. developed that bond of trust. So anyway, there are my point is there are examples of of outsiders coming in and really, um, yeah, yeah. I, th- I think yeah, I think that's that's probably true with any group you can look at. There's both the truth of some inherent suspicion, but also the truth that you have a lot of uh, things working toward you being accepting of outsiders till they prove themselves you know, wrong otherwise. But I want to move on to something else. I want to kind of go into a couple of things that uh, we read in the, the article uh, where you were quoted extensively. Uh, so let me read this first quote and, then, uh, quote, and then I'll ask you to help us understand how what you're talking about there might be applied in a current controversy. You know, right now, as you know, we have a, a, a bit of a controversy in our state over the status of the Buffalo River. Uh, is it going to maintain the way it is and has been, uh, or is it going to change from like a, I believe it's a, from a national park to a national preserve is one of the main conversations. Um, I think it would be helpful in our better appreciating all the factors that can lead us to dismiss ideas you know, that come from someone else simply because they're not consistent with our tribe's views. Uh, If we can learn some things from that, that will help us make better decisions and how to avoid being misled or manipulated by folks who don't necessarily have our group's interests in mind. So let me read this quote from the article and then I'll ask you to uh, comment on it. For now, historical perspective would seem to suggest that local families in the Ozarks who are sincerely interested in rural living and in protecting the land and river for future generations ought to be carefully mindful of what interests are indeed at stake and who's pushing in what direction and for what reason. They should work diligently to maintain healthy checks and balances in such coalitions because interests with more money and resources can have a tendency to run away with the ball and suddenly leave their teammates standing in the dust. And they need to recognize real allies and keep them close, even if they look, talk, live, or otherwise do things a little differently than they do. So can you help us unpack, you know, what you're thinking there and how it might apply to our current controversy over the Buffalo River status? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think, I mean, as a historian, I'll, I'll maybe give a couple of historical examples. Uh, it really came to mind when uh, uh when I, I gave that that quote there, uh, so so yeah, I mean I mean to your point, I think it's it's very important for people to really you know dig in and and uh, 
and learn about what's going on, who's involved, and and you know as much as possible what what's uh, what's going on, what what what's at stake, right? I mean, in 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 these kinds of cases, and so. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there are are instances, are cases in which, um, you know, uh, that more powerful groups uh, can be can be pretty clever with uh, with their rhetoric and and with you know um, you know making it sound like, hey, we're we're one of you, and 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 this is our yeah, as you said, this is this is our tribe here, right? And really, kind of fashioning this 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 kind of my team versus that team over there uh there's some but there's i'll just i'll just give you a good example of going back to the late 1800s early 1900s there i think part of what really a big part of what really uh defeated at least the political coalitions that were forming uh for what became known as the populist movement, uh, uh, that, that, that I think genuinely threatened the overthrow of the established uh, at that time Democratic Party in, in power in Arkansas and, and throughout the South. Um, part of what really uh, defeated that that uh, possibility was how. Uh, Many rural whites um, began to, and often often prompted and, and encouraged by, again, rhetoric and things they read in, in, in the press uh, that, that were pushing a certain agenda and so forth. Uh, they 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 often began to uh, really really fail to recognize the similarities that they had with fellow rural blacks. For instance, um, I mean, they, in in a, whole, in a whole lot of ways. Um, I mean, obviously, obviously, rural whites were not, you know, segregated against, discriminated against in the in the kinds of ways rural blacks were. But but economically speaking, um, as, as far as conditions on farm and and you know, um, trying to support families and that kind of thing, in in so many ways, they were in the same boat. Uh, these small rural white farmers, and small rural black farmers, but as this you know, really tribal rhetoric, a lot of it referenced, of course, the old Confederacy and and the, and the, uh, the horrors of Reconstruction, right? Uh, I mean, they were, a lot of the opposition, you know, really uh, played up that, that kind of rhetoric. Again, that tried to sort of using that kind of tribal rhetoric, and it, and it, it often worked. It worked. Uh, it turned a lot of uh, rural whites off. Uh, well, you know, I don't know about that. Uh, uh, and 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 a great example of that, uh, you know, was uh, the election in 1900 of of Governor Jeff Davis in Arkansas. Uh, he he played both sides of the fence. I mean, he he uh, really, even though he actually, as a, as a younger man, had been an opponent of the populist movement, he. Uh, he embraced a lot of the rhetoric and and uh, and even repented at one point. Yeah, if I'd have known then what I you know know now, uh, uh, those old you know those old populists uh, knew what they were talking about kind of thing. Um, and again, we talked a lot in 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 terms of uh, we're going to do things for the workers and the small farmers. So out of that side of that's what he's saying out of one side of his mouth, and out of another, I mean, he's talking about actually encouraging lynching um, and um, you know. Rounding up blacks and putting them in their place, keeping them in their place, and, and that that kind of thing. And so, again, that's that's really kind of the things I'm. I'm I mean, that may maybe an example there, a historical example of, you know, and I, and I would argue that, that in fact the way Jeff Gov- Jeff Davis governed, I mean, he really didn't do much at all to better the lot of the rural white farmers that he was, you know, that he had pulled over to his side. Um, but because of that tribalism that you're referring to, I mean, he he was able to drive that wedge there. So I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, I'm not sure if that completely answers your question, but that's a uh, a historical example. And again, you know, talking about my my comment there about 
realizing and, and being willing to work with people who may look differently, maybe act a little differently or whatever. I mean, you know, I just as a historian, I can't just I just can't help but imagine what might have happened and had rural whites um, and rural blacks have been able to come together there uh, in that in that kind of coalition. And uh, so anyway, yeah. An interesting, yeah. interesting thought. Yeah, it's just you know, a lot of times people who are pursuing power know how to play the populist or similar card and uh, uh, engage in scapegoating. And too many people fall into that. I understand that. So uh, this may help us kind of delve a little deeper into this, this notion you have. It, it's a current controversy uh, in another direction. Uh, this involves uh, the Learns Act, which is the uh, the law that was passed in this uh, past year's uh, legislative uh, session. Uh, our, our governor uh, brought that forth. And among other things, it offers state funding for students to attend private and parochial schools rather than the public school. Um, so it has a lot of support and obviously it passed and it's being implemented. But from what I have gathered, there's been a, a little cross group uh, resistance to that. Uh, people that you might not expect to have the same view. Uh, for instance, what I keep hearing is that a lot of folks in rural areas of Arkansas are skeptical or worse about the Learns Act because they don't have the option of other private or parochial schools anywhere close to where they live out in the country. And so it may jeopardize one of the key pillars of their community, their public school system. So um, it, do you have any uh, thoughts about uh, that history of trust that, you know, sometimes happens with the Ozarkers and how it might have uh, be stoked with regard to that issue? Yeah, you know, I think it, that is interesting. And one of the things I've been, of course, especially as a school board member myself of a very small a rural district, um, you know, uh, paying attention to, of course. But, uh, you know, I, I think uh, historically, I, I, I might mention that um, one of my very first uh, historical research projects I ever worked on was a, a, a master's thesis in which I, uh, I researched and wrote about the history of rural school consolidation in the Arkansas Ozarks from the really the, the first 50 years or so of, of the the, of the 20th century, um, and uh, you know, I, in that in that research, and just in and just having lived in a rural community really all my life, um, I mean, rural people uh, generally are are proud of their local school districts, right? Their, their public school districts, and I mean, it's 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 really at the at the heart of the community, and it has been um, again since since they've been around. I mean, that's it's one of the centerpieces of, of the community uh, just for instance uh, uh, the, the school district there where i live um, just recently hosted a uh it's actually so, so it said the oldest uh oldest uh high school basketball tournament in the state and it was the 101st anniversary of the of this tournament over this past weekend and uh it was just amazing i mean i don't think there have been that many people in that little gymnasium uh as I can remember, you know, the, the people that turn out for, for that. So, you know, the local athletics and, and, uh, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, the, so I think that, that came into play here with, with learns a, a concern. Uh, and, and again, we've been down that road before uh, when, when changes begin to come down the pike, especially um, if they're not well communicated, right on the front end, what is what exactly is this going to do, and how's it going to work, and and so I think that was a big part of the problem uh, was just the, how fast uh, that, that 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 was you know implemented, passed, and you know and, and so forth, and we'll 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 let you know how you know the, 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 the details later and that kind of thing, but but yeah, I think especially in rural communities. Um, uh, because of that history of consolidation, uh, going back to uh, at least the the, the late nineteen uh, twenties um, is really is really sensitive for for a lot of rural rural folks, um, and, and rightfully so. I mean, we see. Uh, well, I, here, here a few months ago, I uh, had taken a trip somewhere there in the Ozarks, and I. 
was coming along there, and I thought, you know, I'm going to take this little detour and go. There was a, it's no longer there. It's no longer a, a school there. It was, it was consolidated. Uh, I'm going to go, go down there and take a look at that old campus and, and the town, you know, there. I mean, it's, it was a, it was a sad sight, you know, see that old school sitting there completely vacated. Uh, there was literally a, a huge oak tree laying in the middle of one of the school buildings, you know, crashed through the roof. Um, the population had just shriveled up. There were only a handful of people still left there. Um, so, I mean, yeah, that, that's the kind of thing that I think goes through our rural folks' minds uh, when, when, uh, when things like this come up, right? So, and, and I think, so yeah, I think, I think that was part of it. I mean, there are all kinds of, I mean, it was, was a huge bill. So all kinds of different components and pieces to it that, uh, you know, we're still learning about what, what exactly is this and, and what's it going to mean down the road, especially. Um, and so, I mean, I think, I think one of the big, big questions is, you know, uh, funding, adequate funding going down the road, right. To, uh, to, to be able to comply with, with some of these changes and, 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 uh, and that kind of thing. I mean, I think there's, uh, not personally, there, there are some some good things in the bill to, uh, as well, but there's there are some things that again, there's still a lot of question marks about. But but yeah, to your point again, I think on the, the some of the rural uh, kick up about that uh, probably is connected to that. And of course, it, for the for for Governor Sanders in particular, I mean, you know, the last round of major school consolidation was uh, Governor Mike Huckabee, you know, her her father, and so I think there's uh, some connecting the dots there uh, on, on some of that. So, Well, that's it for the first part of our conversation, Glenn, with Blake Perkins, but there's so much more to talk about. And we're going to get to that second part of our conversation with Blake in the next episode in which he really talks about some possible ways of improving our relationships across the divide. So I hope folks will join us for that one as well. And when you visit our website, you will see those links to all our episodes. And you'll also find a link to email us at otherhandar at gmail.com with your program feedback or suggested speakers. Now, on the topic of other possible episodes you can listen to, wanted to uh, pitch a couple of them for you to consider. One of those is an interview with Ryan Norris we had recently, who is a head of the Arkansans uh, version of Americans for Prosperity. That's in episodes 57 and 58. Also, another good one to consider is with Senator Clark Tucker, a state uh, senator from the Little Rock area, and that's on episodes 53 and 54. And as always, we'd love to hear your feedback about those and other episodes. On the other hand, is sponsored by Braver Angels in Arkansas. Music was composed by Randall Standridge of Jonesboro, Arkansas. It was performed by the University of Northern Colorado Symphonic Band, Dr. Richard Main, conductor. From your host, Glenn White. And April Chatham Carpenter. Let's each do our part to bring our community closer together.